Welcome, and thank you for joining us this evening for Researching in Libraries and Archives, the Do's and Don'ts. I'm Pam Taylor, manager at the Harford County Pub Public Library's Joppa Branch. This performance is being recorded and will be available along with a handout at hcplonline.org on the HCPL Universe page through April the 13th. Now let's get on with the show. We're thrilled to have Melissa Barker back with us this evening. She really has a passion for genealogy. Melissa is a certified archives manager and public historian currently working at the Houston County Tennessee Archives and Museum. She is affectionately known as the archive lady to the genealogy community. She lectures, teaches, and writes about the genealogy research process, researching in archives and records preservation. She conducts virtual presentations across the United States and other countries for various genealogical groups and societies. She writes a popular blog entitled A Genealogist in the Archives and is a well-known published book reviewer. She has been a professional genealogist for the last 19 years with expertise in Tennessee records, and she's been researching her own family history for the past 33 years. Melissa will be using a PowerPoint during her presentation this evening, and you can adjust what you're seeing on your screen by using the screen view in Zoom. Please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A feature in Zoom, and at the end of the show, I'll try to get to as many of them as I can. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Melissa Barker. Thank you, Pam. Thank you so much for that introduction. And we're going to get started because we've got a lot to talk about. Um, hopefully, you as a genealogist or some sort of researcher that you are, are researching at libraries and archives, whether that's in person or whether that is by email or by going to their social media pages, because we should be using libraries and archives. Granted, there's a tremendous amount of genealogical records online, but I can tell you that there is so much more at the local library or archive, wherever you live. Uh, and so we're going to talk about some do's and don'ts. Now, I'm a very positive thinking person. Um, I like to say that my glass is not only half full, but it's also running over and it's refillable. So my don'ts are not very harsh. So let's start with some of the do's. But we're going to talk about how many records are online. I have been a genealogist for 33 years. And 12 years ago, I became an archivist. I went back to school at the age of 42, uh, received my certification in archives management. Uh, and I actually was instrumental in starting our own county archives here in Houston County, Tennessee, along with six others. Uh, and they hired me, my county actually hired me as, my, as the very first county archivist uh, for Houston County. We started from scratch. We started with boxes and boxes and boxes of records. Uh, and so there are statistics out there. No one can actually find the source for these statistics, but you hear it all the time. There's only so many records online. And so the statistics say that there's less than 10% of the world's records online, genealogical records and historical records. Now, personally, I think that percentage is actually lower. Uh, once I became an archivist and I started working with archives and with other archivists and visiting other archives, getting to see in their back rooms, I realized that there is such a small percentage of records that are actually online. Now, there are more and more coming online every day, which is fantastic for us as researchers, but we still need to remember that we've got to work with these libraries and archives with what they have in their holdings. And again, if you think that you can't travel so you can't do research, I really want you to rethink that. I have lived in Tennessee since I was 10 years old, and I have been doing my genealogy research for 33 years. My ancestors are from West Virginia, Virginia, Ohio, Maryland, and I have been able to do my genealogy research from Tennessee from a distance. Now, I started out writing those old fashioned letters and every once in a while I'll still write a letter. I use the libraries and archives websites. I use their email addresses. I use the telephone. Um, I use their social media pages. And so there are ways, and I've been very successful with my research. Now, there are a few things that I'm going to have to go there to see, but for the most part, I've been very successful. So don't let the fact that you can't travel keep you from doing a lot of your research. So where are genealogical records located? Well, this is the question I tell genealogists to ask. When you are researching in a particular place, ask that question, not only of yourself, but ask that question of those in the community. 
where are the records? And so these records could be in at any place. Well, they could be at libraries, for instance. Uh, our libraries still hold genealogical records, and they may still have just, you know, they may have published histories or published genealogical records, but they also could have microfilm, and they could have what are called special collections. These are actual loose records like manuscript collections, vertical files, family records, photographs, and so we need to be using our libraries in these areas. Archives. The word archives, um, I do lots of presentations and I talk a lot about archives because I'm very passionate about all of our archives. I like to say that there's an archives out there for everything <laughs> and there is an archives out there for everything. Uh, but there are county archives. There are historical and genealogical societies that have archives. There are university and college archives and these are not just archiving college and university records they have family and genealogical records in their archives there are museums uh, there are state archives and so you need to be looking in the area where you're researching and taking note of every single repository that might have records courthouses our courthouses may still have all those old records in their basements in their attics in a closet uh, many times though when you're working at a courthouse it can be a little more difficult because those people that have offices in the courthouse, they're actually doing the business of today. They're helping someone get their driver's license or someone helping someone get their uh, tag renewal for their car or they're getting a marriage license or they're doing a deed. And so when you're talking to these clerks, remember that they are very, very busy doing the work of today. And so when you ask them about old records, they may put you off. They may tell you, oh, they've been thrown away. Uh, or they may tell you, we don't know where the records are. And so have a little compassion for them, but keep digging and keep looking because I'm, those records are there somewhere. They're either at the courthouse or they've been transferred somewhere else. So we have libraries, we have archives, we have courthouses, genealogical societies. These are a fantastic place to find records. Any of our genealogical societies that have buildings with records in them are a type of archive. But none that the genealogical societies have is they have knowledge. Their members are very knowledgeable, not only about the records and maybe where they're located, but they're very knowledgeable about local history and about the families that lived in the area. So really talk to these members and get the information out of them because there may have information that they have that is not on any other record. Historical societies are the same way. Uh, they're all over the United States. And I think that you should be talking to them and just seeing what kind of information they have as far as records go. But again, talking to those members because they have some really, really great knowledge. Museums. I don't know if you've ever thought about doing research at a museum. I actually came late to the idea of using museums for genealogy research. They're a little more difficult to gain access to the records. Uh, museum curators, uh, if you think archivists are very protective of their records, museum curators are even more protective. But if you think about museums and you go to a museum and you see the exhibits and displays, um, you see records on display, you see photographs on display. I like to say that museums have a front room and a back room. The front room, of course, are the exhibits and the displays very nice and pretty and organized and on display for us to see. But museums also have back rooms, just like any other archives, with shelves full of boxes, full of records. So if you see a photograph on display, there's probably more where that came from. If you see a Civil War letter on display, there's probably more where that came from too. And so work with museums, talk to the curators, let them know how serious of a researcher you are, talk to them about maybe if they have more records in the back rooms, and be patient because they may let you have access to those records. Again, university library and archives, um, a very much underused resource. I don't find that genealogists go to these places very often. I think they think all the records that they have pertain to that particular university or that college, uh, but they have family records. They have local records. And how did they get them? Because there was probably no place else for them to go. Uh, you have to remember, our colleges and universities are part of our communities. And so many times these records, if there was no other place for them to go, ended up at our colleges and universities. So don't forget those very important libraries and archives at those institutions. So let's talk about some do's and don'ts. So we're going to start with the do's. And so first and foremost, do check the repository's website. 
Um, I encourage, one of the things that I do as a genealogist is if I'm starting to do research in a new area, for instance, if my ancestor, I find that they moved and went to a different state, a different county, or even if they're within the same state and moved to a different city or a different county, I go looking for all of the different archives or different record repositories that are in that city, in that county. And I make a list of them. And then I start going to finding websites, social media pages, um, and then I start planning a visit or I contact them. Uh, like this is the Tennessee State Library and Archives uh, website. Uh, our state archives, there are 50 of them. We have 50 states and we have 50 Tennessee, uh, we have 50 state archives and 50 websites. They all have very robust websites. Um, I don't know why, but they make them a little bit difficult trying to find information. So you may have to dig, you may have to kind of peel it like an onion and dig down and try to find what you're looking for. But they have a tremendous amount of information on their website. You could probably find a lot just on their website without having to go to the facility. But go to their websites, dig around, see what they have. You're going to go on those websites, you're going to find contact information. There is a place that lists contact information. Uh, so you want to have that information in case you want to email them and ask them about records. You also want to find the physical address and the directions to the facility. They should be on their website, at least the address, and then you can plug that into um, a mapping system to help you get there if you're going to drive. And so finding that physical address and the directions to the facility is very important if you're going, especially if you're going to visit the facility. You also want to look for digitized or indexed records. Many of our state archives are putting these online. I can tell you that because of COVID, um, it actually has lit a fire under a lot of our archives, not just state archives, but a lot of our archives to get things digitized and indexed and on their websites uh, because they want researchers to find this information. So next we're going to plan ahead. So do plan ahead before you travel, call or email. Uh, this is very important. Um, one thing I tell genealogists is that you need to call ahead, even if it's the morning before you leave. There is a lot that happens in an archives and sometimes things happen at the last minute and you don't wanna show up and they're closed. So what are the facilities days and hours of operation? Well, if you go to their website, they may have them listed. However, on a particular day that you're going there, you want to make sure they're going to be open. Maybe they don't have it on their website that they're going to be closed because they're getting new carpet. Maybe um, they've changed their days and hours and they just have failed to change it on their website. So that's why we want to make sure do not trust what you find online. Do they require you to make an appointment? Many of our archives have gone to this method. Uh, and actually, it, they used it a lot during COVID. And they found that they really liked how this worked out. And so many of our archives are keeping that in place. They want you to make an appointment. Um, and so how does that benefit you as a genealogist? Well, let me tell you something. I have people that call my archives and they make appointments. I don't require it, but a lot of people do. And what that does is lets me know on this particular day, I have a researcher coming. And you know, I can block out time on my calendar to spend time with that researcher. How wonderful would that be if you showed up at an archive and they're there waiting for you to give you their undivided attention. Another thing that it does is that when they call or they email me to make this appointment, I can ask some questions. I can say, what are the surnames are you researching? What information are you looking for? What kind of records are you wanting to search when you get here? And when you tell me that information, between the time I talk to you and the time you show up, I can start pulling records. I can start pulling things that I think might be of interest to you. And so as a researcher, wouldn't I love it when I showed up at an archive and they have things already there waiting for me. And so making that appointment is a really a good thing. Are you the records you're seeking at their facility? Um, maybe they say on their website that these records are there, but for some reason within the last month, they've been transferred to another facility, but they never did change it on their website. You don't want to have to be traipsing all over the county trying to find the records you're looking for. So you want to ask them in an email, call them, talk to someone there at the archives. Do 
do you even have these records at your facility? And if you don't, where are they? So get that information as well. Next is one that I find genealogists don't ask about, but it's very important, especially when you show up. Do ask about parking. Um, ask about where the parking is located. How much parking do you have? Um, lots of great questions to ask about parking. I find most researchers just forget about asking about parking because they think, oh, it's an archive. So they're going to have lots of parking because there's researchers coming all the time. You need to ask about parking. And again, I know they list some of this stuff on their website, maybe even on some of their social media pages. And it's not that I don't want you to believe it. I want you to verify it. Some repositories, some archives has, have very limited, limited parking, especially if they are in a metropolitan area. Uh, many of our state archives are located in metropolitan areas and they have very limited parking. Uh, and so always want to find out about the parking. Are there nearby parking garages, parking lots? Are there parking meters? Um, am I gonna have to pay for parking? You don't want to show up and there be a parking meter and it requires change. I actually just watched our local news last night and our local news here where I live comes out of Nashville, Tennessee, and they have parking parking meters downtown Nashville, but they're fixing to switch them over so that you can use credit cards. So that tells me that their parking meters, you still have to have change. And so if you don't have change on you, then you need can't park where those parking meters are. So you've got to be prepared. If you have a disability of any kind that requires you to walk short distances, you can't walk long distances, you need to find that out. You need to talk to them and ask them how far away is the parking from your building because I have difficulty walking very long distances. And a lot of times these parking garages or these parking lots are a little further from the facility than maybe you can handle. Uh, and so they will gladly help you to find uh, a parking for your disability and also tell you what part of the building to come in that is handicap accessible or that is better for someone with a disability to come into the building. So here is an example I want to share with you. This is the Tennessee State Library and Archives in Nashville, Tennessee. I call this my home away from home because for the past 33 years, I have done a tremendous amount of research there. Um, I have been a professional genealogist for 19 years. I no longer take clients, but uh, my profession now is in speaking and teaching and writing. But I have spent a tremendous amount of time here. I also attended the Archives Institute here for three years, uh, becoming an archivist. So I know this building very well. One thing I know about this building is that there is very limited parking. This building is uh, located directly behind the state capitol. And so it's in right downtown Nashville, Tennessee. This photograph was actually taken about 1953 when this building was actually built. You can see by the cars. I love these old cars. But I have um, arrows pointed near some of the parking. I can tell you that there was only about 10 parking spaces for patrons at this building. That is not very much, is it? And if there's, there were people that would park in these parking spaces that didn't even go into this building. Uh, and so it was, it was got to the point where I had my husband just drop me off and he would go off and do something and come back and pick me up because parking was absolutely terrible. Uh, now, the other red arrow there on the left, I'm pointing, uh, pointing to the top part of this building is I wanted to share with you some wonderful records that were in this building. They were the Tennessee Supreme Court records. Um, when I was attending the Archives Institute, we got a chance to work with these records. And uh, they asked us one day, would you like to have a tour of where we keep these records? So we got on the elevator, went to the top floor of this building. And when we stepped out, as far as our eye could see, were nothing but shelves full of boxes that filled with Tennessee Supreme Court records. So they are constantly working on those records. And if you have Tennessee ancestors, I would encourage you to go to their website because as they process them, they are indexing them and that index is on their website. You can look for your ancestors. If you find a record, you can actually order copies of the record and have them mailed to you. So this is the Tennessee State Library and Archives as it looked in 1953. And they only had about 10 parking places. Well, thankfully, in 2021, we got a brand new building. 
This is our brand new Tennessee State Library and Archives. Uh, it was opened in April of 2021. Uh, I actually was just at this building yesterday, um, but the most fantastic thing that all genealogists who have ever researched the Tennessee State Library and Archives is so excited about is that when they built this building, they built an underground parking garage just for those who come to this building. And when you get your library card, you use that library card to access the parking garage and there's 150 parking spaces. Now, I, there, I don't get excited about parking very much, but I'm very excited about the parking garage for this building. So next is do ask about using electronics. Uh, when I give um, presentations about researching in archives, I get this question all the time about Am I allowed to bring in my phone? Am I allowed to bring in a camera? Um, and so I can tell you that it honestly depends on the facility. Every facility has their own rules and their own guidelines that you have to follow. And so ask about using electronics. Maybe you have an iPhone or an iPad or something you wanna take photos with. Ask them before you go, because you don't wanna take this equipment with you and they tell you, nope, you can't bring it in. And so ask before you go. How about laptop computers? Um, you would think that all of these facilities would just allow this to come in because they're just so normal everyday things that we have now, but many archives still do not allow these things. And so ask about it before you actually haul it down to the archives. Um, I have actually had genealogists want to bring in handheld scanners uh, to scan documents. Now, one of two things is probably gonna happen. They won't let you bring in the handheld scanners because handheld scanners, you can actually damage documents and photographs by using them, especially if you're using them improperly. And we don't know if you're gonna use it properly. Another thing is, is that hand, we in the archives field, a lot of times when we charge our copy fees, it's not because we're being mean, it's because those revenues help us operate our archives. It puts money in our revenues and it helps us to buy copy paper. It helps us to buy the ink. It helps us to buy microfilm machines. And so a lot of times we don't want you to take photographs or scan documents yourself. We want you to pay for those copies or pay for the digital copies because it helps us out and helps us to keep going. Thumb drives. Um, actually, now there are some wonderful, I can remember back when we had microfilm machines, back when you had to crank the microfilm machine. Now microfilm machines, you can actually take in a thumb drive and download the images to your thumb drive and just take your thumb drive home. But you still need to ask, can I bring a thumb drive and use it to get records? So always great to ask. Do ask about copy fees. I just mentioned copy fees and many of our archives and libraries do charge copy fees. Some are more advanced than others. Some will take a credit card or uh, other ways of making electronic payments, but there are still a lot of our libraries and archives that do it the old fashioned way, cash. And so you need to make sure that if they have microfilm machines, the older ones that take quarters, that you take a roll of quarters. I don't know how many rolls of quarters I have gotten from the bank over the years, but you need to make sure that you have quarters, you have nickels, you have dimes, whatever is needed for microfilm machines, for copy machines, and for digitization machines. Many times they charge for that as well. So if you need to take cash with you, you need to know that. Most report repositories charge copy fees uh, for copies and microfilm readers. And so if they have the kind where you have to put the change in yourself, you want to have change for that. Find out what the fees are before you go. Um, they may have the fees listed on their website, but I would call and ask and make sure or email them that the fees are still the same. And it's possible that they have changed out all of their equipment and you no longer have to pay a fee. You no longer have to have change. So no reason to bring all that change, which is heavy, if you don't need it. So it's always great to find all these things out. Bring correct change. Now, the Tennessee State Library and Archives has a change machine and you can get change. But I have been there on days when they have run out of change. And so it's important that you bring correct change. You don't want to depend on the fact that they may have a change machine on the premises. Next is do make a to-do list. Um, I see it all the time when genealogists walk into my archives, 
they are simply overwhelmed and so excited about doing research that they just don't know what to do first. And so make a to-do list. Um, if you're not a list type person or even that organized, I would still encourage you to do a to-do list. This will help you keep focused on the task at hand. Uh, put what is the most important, what you want to get before you leave the facility on number one, and then list the rest of them. Will you get through your whole to-do list? Probably not. But whatever you get through is great. And then when you get home, you can email, call, talk to the archives and say, listen, I was there. I was able to get a lot of work done, but this is what's remaining. I would like to work with you on getting the remaining information. But if you do a to-do list, it will definitely keep you focused and it will keep you on task from going from one thing to the next. Um, it's very exciting to go onto that microfilm or get into those boxes of records and find information. But if you stick to a to-do list, you'll get a lot more out of your visit. I would also encourage you to do a to-do list when you're researching online. Um, one of the things that I do is that when I sit down to do research, which is not as often as I would like because I uh, work full time and then I speak and teach full time. So um, I still sit down and do a to-do list because I want the time, precious time that I have to research. I want to make sure I'm going to the right websites. I'm looking for specific information or a specific document. So I still make a to-do list. But they will help you keep focused. If you are the type that you can get distracted very easily, a to-do list is a really good thing for you. Be very specific on your to-do list. So if you have your to-do list and you have get everything for the Smith family, that is not going to help you. So I would encourage you to be as specific as possible on your to-do list. And be as specific as possible whenever you're talking to an archivist or a librarian about what you want. Because if you tell them you want everything for the Smith family, I don't know how much of a response, especially by email that you're going to get. Uh, hopefully they'll respond to you and ask you to be more specific. But if you walk into the building and you ask for everything for the Smith family, um, they can't do that. So ask for specific documents. If you don't know what you want, you know, give them a brief outline of the family you're researching. Please don't give them the three hour speech, but give them a brief outline. And then the archivist or the librarian might be able to think, okay, well, let's look at these records and they have some ideas for you. Try, try, try to stick to your to-do list as much as possible. One of the worst things is if you have a to-do list or if you have an idea of what you want to accomplish when you're at a facility and the time is up, they're closing the doors and you have to leave and you did not get done what you wanted to get done by a long shot. So try to stick to your to-do list. You don't want to go chasing after those bright, shiny objects. And what are bright, shiny objects? Those are things we find in the archives that may or may not have something to do with our family, but it has caught our attention and we're following down the rabbit hole. Uh, maybe make a note of something. Maybe you see something for another branch of the family that you're not there to research. Make a note of it. Uh, and then when you go back to the facility or you email the archivist, you can ask them about it. Uh, and so try to stay on task. Next is do ask about vertical files. Uh, this is actually a record source, do. Um, if you're not researching in vertical files, I would encourage you to do so. I do a whole presentation on vertical files. They are fabulous records. Now you're not gonna probably see these in the research area, the place where you have the tables and the chairs. These are probably gonna be behind closed doors. So you can ask for an index of vertical files. Uh, the index is usually arranged by surname or subject name. So vertical files, I like to say that they're like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get with these files. Um, they are in filing cabinets. They are truly a hodgepodge of all kinds of wonderful records and things you don't find in any other record sources. They can also be called subject files. I've also seen them called morgue files. Uh, a lot of times these files are filled with nothing but newspaper clippings. But majority of vertical files contain all kinds of things. Uh, they are a collection of miscellaneous records, and in those miscellaneous records, you could find an original photograph, you could find copies out of a, uh, the genealogical information copies out of a Bible, or you could find a family group sheet, or you could find all kinds of things. Uh, that's why I love them, because they can find all kinds of different things. 
Uh, newspaper clippings, uh, you're going to find a lot of those in vertical files. You might find some brief family histories, business letterheads, church records, school records. Uh, all of them could be in vertical files. Do ask about manuscript collections. Um, this is one of those really underused records collections that genealogists, I just they just don't ask about them when they come to my archives and I'm always having to suggest them. Now in parentheses, you see the word fonds. Um, that is the word that is used in Canada and in uh, many countries in Europe uh, to describe manuscript collections. So they would be fonds collections. So if you're doing research in Canada and Europe, keep in mind that manuscript collections, what that's to us, are called fonds collections. Manuscript collections are some of the most valuable and useful records to us as genealogists. I actually find more information in manuscript collections about my family than I do any other records collection. And I'm asked all the time, well, what exactly is a manuscript collection? They have, uh, genealogists have it in their minds that it's a manuscript, like a draft of a book before it's published. And that is called a manuscript. But in this case, case a manuscript collection is a collection of genealogical or historical records. So keep in mind uh, all of the records that you have in your genealogical records collection. That could be census records, birth records, death records. Um, maybe you have scrapbooks or diaries or old family letters. And then on top of that, you've got grandma's quilt or you've got your mother's wedding dress or you have a lock of hair. Uh, so you can see, it's take all of that, put it in boxes. And if you were to donate, donate that to an archive, that is a manuscript collection. So as you can see, literally anything could be in a manuscript collection. Um, and so each collection is assigned a specific name, such as the John Smith Papers, 1648 to 1772. And the archivist or librarian should have an index of their manuscript collections. The most important part, other than the records themselves, of a manuscript collection is the finding aid. The finding aid is a document that is produced by the archivist who is processing the collection, who's getting it ready for researchers. And it has a tremendous amount of information on the finding aid for the collection, but it's literally a box by box, folder by folder listing of what is in the collection. You're gonna find that listing under the contents listing of the finding aid. So for instance, you may have a collection uh, and, and in box one, folder three is correspondence from, from 1762 to 1772 that should be on the finding aid. And so if you think to yourself, well, there may be something in that particular box and that particular folder I want to look at, you can ask for that to be brought to you. And sometimes they'll bring you the whole box. Sometimes they'll bring you just the folder. And then you can look and see what kind of correspondence is in there. So reading the finding aid to, record, to manuscript collections is very important. A lot of these finding aids and indexes are on the archives website. So you can do a lot of legwork online before you actually contact them by email or visit their facility. And if you have those box and folder numbers, the archivist will love you because it's a, they can go right to it, get it and bring it right to you. So do ask the archivists about other repositories. Remember me talking about it was a very good idea to gather information on all the different places where records are located in a particular area. Well, you may not know where all of these places are. They may not have an internet presence. They may not have a website. They may not have any social media pages. And so ask the archivist, ask the librarian, what other places in your area have records? Again, ask the question, where are the records? So this is actually a photograph of the Stewart County, Tennessee archives, which is the county next door to where I live. Um, if any of you do Civil War research, this is the county where the Battle of Fort Donelson or the Fort Donelson battlefield is located. And they have fantastic records. Uh, and so this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying talk to archivists about what kind of records. And so Jim Long is the archivist here at this archives and we talk back and forth all the time. He knows about my archives. I know about his archives. And in fact, my county was actually formed from parts of his county. So when we have researchers come in, we are constantly sending them to one another's archives because they overlap um, as far as records go and time frames go. And so ask the archivist because we talk to each other. We talk to other archivists in our area. Uh, and so we know who they are. We know their facilities usually. 
And so sometimes there's more than one facility that have records that you're looking for. Uh, you, in one area, you may find a county archive, a historical society that has records, um, a college in the community that's got records, and on and on, and a museum. And so you want to check all of the facilities. If you don't find what you're looking for, ask the archivist where those records might be found. Uh, and if they don't know, I, then I would encourage you to ask some people in the community. I've been known to contact the Chamber of Commerce and ask them about records. Um, I've actually one time uh, actually asked the Chamber of Commerce, some members of their chamber, who is the oldest person in your community that is still at themselves? And I reached out to them and I said, OK, where are the records? They knew right where records were being stored. That was not in any archive. They were in an abandoned building. Um, I was actually able to gain access to those records because I talked to the person who owned the building. I did a lot of legwork to try to find these records because a lot of times they're not in archives. They're not nice, pretty, processed and in boxes ready for researchers. They're still sitting in abandoned buildings, attics, basements and things like that. Most archivists are well versed in what records exist and where they can be located. And so that's why it's important that we work with these people um, and that we uh, show them that we're very serious about our research and they'll be very helpful for you. This one is one that genealogists don't like. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not a huge, I hate having to source my records, but I have learned over the years that it is very helpful to source the records that you get. So do cite your sources, but do it before you leave the archive. Um, I've had this happen to me. I've been in a facility. I have copied some pages out of a particular book. Um, then I get home and I start reading what I've copied, start putting it into my genealogy database. And I realize I didn't get the last page. There was another page I needed to copy. But did I write down the name of that book or any kind of a source for that book? No. And so then I have no idea what book I got it out of. So it's important that you write the source of your book, of your books, of the manuscript collections, the vertical files, whatever records you get copies of, uh, write your sources down before you leave. Now, what might help you is if the facility allows you to bring in your phone or a camera, take pictures of the title page of the book or the binding of the book. If you're working in manuscript collections, take a picture of the label on the box. Uh, that will help you to not have to write so much. Maybe you can take pictures and you'll know. So citing our sources can be tedious work, yes, but it is necessary um, because you want your research to be credible. Uh, if you put something out online that you have this document and or this piece of information and someone contacts you and says, well, how do you know that piece of information? Well, you want to be able to tell them, well, I found it in this source and here is the source citation for it. Uh, record the information um, for the documents before you leave the repository. Believe me, when you get back home, you're not going to remember where you found it. And so take the time to stop and record that source information before you leave. One book that might help you with this is Elizabeth Sean Mills book, Evidence Explained. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it really just about any bookstore. But I encourage you, this is not a book that you're gonna sit down and read like a novel to get all the information and you're done. It is a true reference book. I keep it on my desk. I reference it almost every day. And it will help you to use those source citations for your benefit, help you to construct them. Uh, you don't have to be perfect at them. I way I use my source citations is I put enough information in them so that if I want to go back to that source or uh, if I'm no longer here and my children, grandchildren want to pick up my research, they can read those source citations and it will take them right to where that document or that book is located. So now we've done a lot of do's and we're going to talk about some don'ts. And now remember, I'm a very positive person, so my don'ts aren't too bad. This is one we saw before, isn't it? Don't forget to plan ahead. I wonder why I put this in again, because I really think it's important. If you don't call ahead, you're going to show up and they're going to be closed. Uh, maybe they had a water leak overnight and so they're closed. So that's why I tell people to call even on the day that you're going. Um, even if you have traveled and you stayed in a hotel, call before you go. 
uh, because you just don't know what's going to happen. Call or email the repository. Find out the days and hours of operation before you travel. Um, I know this is a duplicate from earlier, but I think it's one of the most important. I find that genealogists will try to come to my archive and I've had something happen and I've had to close. I can tell you, I was telling the people before we got on here that we had a very bad windstorm about a week ago here in Tennessee. And the, where my archive is, it's in the courthouse. Our electricity went out. They closed the courthouse at one o'clock. Uh, and so they sent us all home. And if you're a researcher coming in to do research, you got to call and find out what's happening. You just don't know what's going to happen. Many of our archives are operated by volunteers. What if none of the volunteers could come in that day? Well, the archives are not going to open. So it's just very, very important. Don't be surprised if they search your belongings. Uh, this happens at many of our archives. Uh, they'll search your bags coming in and they'll search your bags going out. Um, and some do this and some don't. Mainly I have seen this happen at state archives and some of our larger metropolitan archives. Um, and so it's important that you know that this might happen. And so a lot of times they'll give you a uh, place to put your bags. So some repositories will routinely search purses, bags, backpacks, um, and other belongings. So don't be alarmed at that. They're not trying to look and see what you have in there as far as, you know, getting in all your business. But they are making sure that you're not bringing in anything that you're not supposed to. And then when you leave, they're really checking to make sure that you didn't accidentally put something in your bag that doesn't need to be in there. Now, there is... Uh, an instance of people who steal very valuable and very valuable historically documents from our archives. It has happened in the past. And so don't think they're accusing you. They're just making sure you didn't happen to pick up something that you shouldn't have. So don't be alarmed. Uh, it's a very quick process and you'll be on your way. So a lot of times they'll search your bags when you enter and when you leave or just when you enter or just when you leave. And so you just need to be aware that that might happen. Uh, missing records or stolen records are very rampant in our archives, whether it's intentional or not. Once they are out the door, a lot of times they're gone forever. And so that's why sometimes they want to search. Don't be surprised if they have you put your belongings in a locker. Uh, there are many of our archives that actually have lockers and they want you to put all of your belongings beside, except for a pencil and maybe a few sheets of paper that have your research on it. That's about all you can take into the research room. I know one archives that doesn't even allow you to bring in your own pencil. They, they give you a pencil. So be prepared for these types of steps. Um, so they require some uh, visitors to put their belongings in a locked locker. It will be safe. Um, you will be the only one who could get into that locker. And so just know that it's safe. Uh, and that's why I tell people, call ahead, find out what you can bring. Bring with you as little as possible. Um, so that way you don't have to worry about locking it up and keeping up with it. You should be allowed to bring in your research to the facility, um, a notepad and a pencil maybe. Uh, again, be prepared. They may give you scrap paper and their own writing utensils, whether it's a pencil or something like that, into the research area. Sometimes they're very, very picky. But don't worry, your belongings will be safe in the locker. Um, and when you're done, you'll be able to retrieve them and go on about your way. But I'm telling you these things because a lot of times genealogists get to these facilities and they just don't know what to do. They've brought a big backpack. They've brought their laptop. They've brought all of these things and they find out I can't even take them into where I need to take them. And so if you know that ahead of time, you won't have to worry about carrying them around. Don't be surprised if you're asked to wear gloves. Now, this is something that has been argued for decades. And I can tell you that now we have come to the agreement in the archives world that the only time we want normally our patrons to wear gloves is when they're handling photographs. Uh, if you are hand, putting gloves on and handling documents, we have found over the years that it, you lose the textile sensation in your fingertips. And so when you are handling documents, you could actually do more damage to the documents with gloves on than with gloves off. But with photographs, the way that the materials are in photographs, the dirt and oils, even if you have clean hands, can actually transfer to those photographs. And the more they're handled, the more likely they can be damaged. So you may be handed a pair of gloves uh, when you are working with uh, photographs. 
And so the wearing of gloves to handle documents is really not done anymore. Um, and so it's an ongoing debate sometimes, but I think I haven't heard it in a long time. So maybe we finally have settled down on what we're doing now. You could be asked to wear gloves when handling photographs. Uh, if you are very lucky to find photographs in an archive for your ancestors, uh, don't be surprised if they ask you to put on some gloves. But there may be a bonus. They may actually let you keep those gloves because uh, once you put them on many archives, um, of course, uh, especially, you know, the, the waning days of COVID, they were letting people keep their gloves. And so just take them and put them in your pockets and you can take and bring them back with you. Um, they may not let you use gloves if you bring your own gloves because they don't know where those gloves have been. They don't know how dirty they are. So they will probably give you a pair of brand new gloves. And they may give you those white cotton gloves like you see historically, or they may give you a pair of nitrile gloves. If you're allergic to latex, you need to let them know and they can give you latex free gloves. So just make sure and tell them that. Don't share all of your family history with the archivist. Um, I mentioned this earlier. If you come in and ask for everything for the Smith family, or if you come in and the archivist asks you, how can I help you today? And you start your family story and you're still telling your family story after an hour or so, that is not going to be helpful. Um, you need to be thinking about that there are more uh, researchers in the room. The archivist has so many tasks that they have to do. They are there to help you. They want to help you, but they don't need to hear the entire story. So be specific with your records request. Um, if you can't be specific, if you just don't know, to ask to for to be uh, pointed in a direction of a set of records that you can start with. Uh, and so give them what they need to know to help you get started. So please don't say I want copies of everything for the Smith family. We literally still get these requests in an email. We get phone calls. We get people that come in and they and I'll say, well, what can I do for you today? And they'll say, well, you know, I'm researching my Smith family. I just want everything you have on the Smith family. And I just, you know, and I'm very, very cognizant of the fact that they just don't understand how much would have to be gone through to look for everything for the Smith family. So let's be specific. Um, unfortunately, many of our archivists are not professional genealogists, and they are not there to do your research for you. Uh, that is a very important point to keep in mind. Um, I have always said, because I am a genealogist who became an archivist, um, I've often said that genealogists should be archivists, so you can see what that's like. But I've also said archivists should be genealogists because I think archivists would understand genealogists a lot better if they were one. But they aren't going to do your research for you. Now, that's why we need to be specific as far as what record we're looking for. And then we need to be specific on what record sources we want to look into. And so if you just tell them, can you just do the research and look for this? They're probably not going to do that. If they do do that, if they tell you, yes, we will do this research for you, I can almost guarantee you they're going to charge you a research fee. And so don't expect the archivists and librarians and museum curators to do your research for you. We need to be prepared when we go to do this research. Don't expect to find all records and in collections indexed. Um, you know, I wish we had the time to index everything in our archives, but we don't. We get a lot of things indexed, we do. But there is still so much more that needs to be indexed. Um, and there are a lot of old records that are in books, the big ledger books, that don't have an index in them. Uh, and the archivist has an index, so you may have to sit down and read. Many newspapers, while they may have indexed the obituaries in them, but they haven't indexed everything in that newspaper. Uh, that's why I encourage genealogists to read the entire newspaper, because you're going to find more that way. Here's an example of our circuit court loose records uh, index. Uh, and so this may be what an index looks like for you. It gives the person's name. In this case, it gives the, the case file name, the type of case that it is, the date of the case, and then it gives the location. How, oh, sorry, how many pages are in that case file? And then it gives the location. So if you're looking at an index, whether it's online or at the facility, this is where that legwork is going to come in. It's going to help you and the archivist. Write down box three, file 30, when you're asking for the Eugene Aaron case file. If you give them the box number and the file number, 
I guarantee you it will be retrieved a lot faster. And so look at these indexes if they're there and grab this information. But remember, not all records are indexed. So ask about index collections. They can save you a lot of time. And again, many of these may be on the website. Um, ask the archivist in an email or on the telephone call when you talk to them, do you have index collections? And they may point you to their website. This may save you a lot of time. Not all records have been indexed and not all records that have been indexed is an every name index. This is one thing I find genealogists don't think about. When you're looking at an index for a court minute book, it may only be indexed by the plaintiff and the defendants. That doesn't mean that every single name in that minute book has been indexed. That's why it's important we still need to read and we still need to look at the entire record source. Indexing is very time consuming uh, and some repositories don't have the staff to complete this task on all of their collections. Many of us um, are paid workers, uh, but we also have volunteers that come in and help us, which we love our volunteers. I know that I have a volunteer that comes in twice a week in the afternoons, and a lot of what she does is indexing, and I'm extremely grateful to her for the work that she does, but she can only get to so much as well. And so we may, as genealogists, have to do a lot more reading and a lot more researching in these records because there is not an index or there's not an every name index. And so be prepared for that. This is one that I find genealogists kind of look at me strange. Uh, don't rearrange the order of the documents. Um, have you ever thought about that? Uh, this is actually a vertical file. And now in vertical files, I would not put this rule on vertical files as much I would, as I would some other records, but this is a vertical file. And as you can say, there's a newspaper clipping, there's a receipt, there's a handwritten note. Uh, there's other things in this vertical file. This is the McKinnon family vertical file, well-known family in our area. So when you're researching in records, and if you've gotten a hold of a manuscript collection and you're looking in a particular file, as you're looking through that, I would encourage you to just um, take the pages and go through them one at a time and keeping them in that order that they're in. Because some documents and folders are in a particular order for a reason. Sometimes in court cases, they're in chronological order. Uh, and so that's why I encourage you now just to do this. And this is simply to help the next researcher that comes along. If you take the documents and you've jumbled them all up and they're not in their original order, when the next researcher comes along, they may not be able to understand the file because it's not in its original order. And so this is just something I really, it's kind of my own, I guess, pet peeve, keeping those uh, records in order. If you look through a folder of documents, keep them in the order that you found them in the folder. They may not be in any kind of order, but just think about uh, doing the best you can on that. So rearranging that order of those documents, it might make more work for the archivist, but it also might be confusing to the next researcher that comes along and looks at that same file folder. Don't leave your area messy. This is one that I tell genealogists when I talk about organization, organizing your genealogical records, and I tell genealogists to have a dedicated working space. And I tell genealogists to, at the end of the day or end of the time when you're done doing research, to clean up your area. One thing that I find as a genealogist is that if I clean up my area and if I organize it a little bit, put things back away, when I come back, whatever day that is or whatever hour that is, and my space is already cleaned up, I am ready to jump in to do research. But if I have to come back to my space and it's messy and I have to clean it up before I can even start to do research, that's not what I want to do. And so let's, when we're at archives, when we're actually visiting an archive or a library or wherever we're doing research, when you're finished, clean up your table or research area of any trash. Uh, and so maybe they have boxes for recycling or they just have trash cans. Think about that. Do not leave behind any record copies that you've made. I've actually done that. I have actually done that. I have gotten home and I went, where is the copies that I made? I've left them in the copier. <laughs> I've left them on the table. And as an archivist, I have found the copies on tables at copiers. And I'm like, who did this belong to? Who forgot them? And so make sure to take the time to look at your area and make sure you have all of your copies.
Um, leave your table and area clean for the next researcher. Um, I have actually come to places in archives where the tables and researcher just left it in a total mess and I had to clean up after them. And so another reason why to clean up your area. And so those are my do's and don'ts. Uh, and remember, it's not all online. Visit an archive today. Thank you very much for attending this presentation. Please visit my blog, A Genealogist in the Archives. You can also find me on Facebook at The Archive Lady. And after this presentation, if you still have questions, please email me. The, my email address is also on the handout. And with that, I'm going to turn it over for any questions that we might have. Sure, we do have a few. Um, so I uh, had a couple of people asking if you could, um, are you sharing your slides? And in the very, very, very beginning, when you first began, you had a list of places to check and mm -hmm. she was asking to put that slide up again. Sure, um, let me go back this way. This would be easier. I'm not sure if you're sharing your slides or just the hand up that you um, gave us. Uh, is that it right there? It could be, I'm not, I don't know who answered the question. So okay. if you have a question, then um, hopefully that answers your answers yeah. that you're looking for. Thank you so much for that. Um, the next question is, is it best to do research on one person or to do research or two and, or three people at a time? My advice is to do research on one person at a time. Um, I find that I get overwhelmed, confused. Um, I, I don't focus too well. So I do one person at a time. And now while you're doing that, though, you're going to find yourself finding records or one having questions about their spouse, about their children, um, and that's fine. But researching one person at a time, gathering as much as you can, and then moving to the next person, I find that it helps me. So, but then again, that might be an individual thing. There might be people out there that can research one, two, three people at a time and do just fine. And so whatever you feel comfortable doing is, you know, the best, but I advise one person at a time. Thank you. Um, you had mentioned research fees. So somebody asked, what's a reasonable research fee? Uh -huh. um, a reasonable research fee, it depends on what you're asking for. But I think that if you go to a repository's website or if you talk to them, main thing, talk to them um, and ask them if they have research fees. And they may tell you that the first hour is so much. And then after that, it's so much per hour. Um, and so they may have a scale that you can look at and they go by. Um, and so I would encourage you to talk to them because every repository is going to have a different scale and different fees. Okay, another question to ask. Um, so here's another one um, that came through our question and answer. Um, when you're using a vertical file at an archive or library do you, to do research, is there acceptable time limit to spend on the project? I would think that I would get lost in the file and spend hours upon hours. <laughs> Um, I would think that the only limit would be is if they are going to close. <laughs> um, I have been at archives where they would, you know, tell everybody we have 10 minutes and we're fixing to close. Um, and so, yeah, no, I would think that you could keep the file that you've requested for as long as you need it uh, and then turn it back in. Great. What is the TSLA address again, please? Um, our address, the address of the TSLA is if you're, I don't know if you're talking about the website or the physical address, but if you just research, if you Google Tennessee State Library and Archives, you'll find the website. Uh, their physical address is actually 1001 Representative John Lewis Way in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you. Next question. You find your ancestors in a certain city or county. Where do you start first? Um, you start local. I would start at the local library if they have one. Then I would see if they have a county archive. Not all counties have a county archive, but especially look for those historical and genealogical societies because they have a lot of great knowledge about where records are located, what repositories are there. And then don't forget, you know, the local churches may have records, local schools may have records. Uh, and so just start local because depending on how big the county is, let's just take the county, it may have a metropolitan government within that county. Um, maybe it has small cities. So go local, check with the Chamber of Commerce, see if they can give you information. Very good. Um, another person asked, 
What was the title of the Elizabeth Schoen Mills book that you referenced earlier? It is, uh, the name of the book is Evidence Explained. If you go to anywhere they sell books and look for Evidence Explained by Elizabeth Shawn Mills, you should be able to find it. Very good. Um, and then somebody had a, just a comment about the gloves issue. And they said this week in the New York Times, there's an article that said no gloves are used when handling rare books. That yep. may go on with what you said. Um, yep. And I don't have any other questions. Oh, I take it back. Maybe one, I got one more. Um, another person asking if you're going to share your slides in your um, PowerPoint. This person said, I saw some of my family names on one of them. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, the recording will be available, I believe. Uh, uh, and so maybe Pam can um, speak to that. Yes, you're on the uh, recording will be available for um, four weeks. So you can always look it up that way. Thank you. And the last name was Pulley, P-U-L-L-E-Y. Oh, yeah, it's a very, that's a very well-known name here in our county in Tennessee. Very good. I don't see any other questions. I'm going to look and see if I have anything else coming in here. Now, um, I did want to mention for Harvard County Public Library that Ancestry Library Editions is avail available only inside our branches. Um, and we're also an affiliate for Family Search. So um, the enhanced digital content is only available at our Bel Air Library branch. Um, there's no remote access for in-home use. So if you're looking to do those types of things, you just come into the branch for that. Um, and I bring that up because we do have lots of different resources on our website. Um, if you go to hcplonline.org forward slash genealogy, you'll see more of those um, genealogy resources. Um, and the links for Ancestry, Fold3, and Family Search also include tutorials that will help you navigate your way through all that information that's online that they offer. Um, so I want to thank everyone again for joining us tonight. Um, as a reminder, the performance was recorded and will be available along with that handout at hcplonline.org on the HCPL Universe page through April the 13th. Um, and remember that we're going to have Melissa back one more time on May the 9th, and she is going to present Family Gatherings, Dragging Genealogy Information Out of Your Family, and that just sounds like a lot of fun. That's on May the 9th, and you can go what, um, register for that on our website. So thanks, everyone, for joining us this evening, and have a great rest of your week.